Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I am Chris. This is the final video of the uh, How Islam Saved Western Civilization. We're just going to knock the rest out in one video. Okay, so this is part eight, if you're keeping up, and video. So, notice the dates, though. We are told that the Dark Ages start when Rome falls on September 4, 476 AD. I told you at the beginning, Rome didn't fall that day. It fell May 29, 1453. How do I know? On that date in September in 476, all that happened was Romulus Augustus, the Western Roman Emperor, took off his purple robes, stuck it in a box with a note, sent it to Emperor Zeno, the Eastern Roman Emperor, and said, there's no reason for two emperors. Let's just do one. You're it. I abdicate. That's not the same as Rome fell. On May 29, 1453, Ottoman soldiers entered Constantinople, the Roman capital, and captured it. And Rome ceased to own any real estate. That's when a state falls, is when it doesn't own real estate. That's how I know Rome didn't fall that moment. But what we are told is that the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the medieval period starts with the fall of Rome in 476 and doesn't end until sometime around 1492, that it lasts a thousand years. There's a thousand years without knowledge, but I just showed you that there was actually extraordinary developments that were taking place, including calculus 600 years before Newton. Ibn al-Haytham stated Newton's first law of motion 600 years before Newton. He, he actually described Kepler's first law of planetary motion 500 years before Kepler. When I was working on my, gra my graduate degree, I started to get into Heidegger, who is very controversial, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. He was a Nazi for 11 months. Bad Heidegger. Bad. Bad. He denounced the Nazi party after 11 months and said, you're all a bunch of charlatans. I reject you. And then he spent the rest of World War II as an outcast. But still, that 11 months were gross. Uh, he got his professor fired and then took his job. His professor was a guy named Husserl. He was Jewish. I, I'm doing this because I just don't want anybody to be confused about why I'm reading Heidegger. I'm reading Heidegger and I realized something in his bibliography. He's called... I, just, I almost pulled this thing up. I just want to say, and I'm not defending this guy, you can still be a genius, a brilliant person, and be on the wrong side of history, being a Nazi, probably not that guy's, it's not what he bragged about first, I would say, but that doesn't take away from the, the brain, you know, the, the knowledge. And he did it for 11 months. I think he kind of realized, yeah, this probably isn't for me. It sounded like a great idea, turned into a bad one. And I think that, that says a lot and he didn't stay in it I think that's better um, that he did get out yeah bad but he got out of it so that tells you at least he was smart enough to 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 push back and say yeah I don't want a part of this I don't know anything about this person so I'm just kind of defending him a little bit those 11 months probably the worst example of this person's life but if, if you just have an 11 month span where you could say this person was terrible, and let's say they lived to be 80, then you have a 79 year window of something to probably be proud of. I'm just throwing that out there. You know, you could still be smart and be on the wrong side of history, was my point. Shh. Quoting Ibn al Haytham and Ibn Sina. And at the time, I didn't know who they were. So I went, who are these guys? I made over $10 million on Amazon. No, you didn't. No. You're lying. You were full of garbage, my friend. You're full of bunk. Full of malarkey.
when he was quoting Ibn Sina, the reason he was quoting Ibn Sina is because his teacher, Husserl, who by the way was brilliant, he shouldn't have fired him, this is ugly, Husserl had taken Hegel and Ibn Sina and merged them and created a new branch of philosophy called phenomenology. So when Heidegger was taking his thing on being in time to the next level, he was building off of that. And then of course, <clears throat> um, that became the moment when philosophy in the world completely changed. Everybody who hates Heidegger is still a Heideggerian. There's no going back. Heidegger changed philosophy, he grabbed it, he shook it, he flipped it upside down and he redid it. But part of his inspiration for this was that conversation I had with you earlier about Ibn Sina and the nature of the universe. He took and built on that and then changed philosophy forever. So even though the guy was a thousand year old thinker, he was still playing a major role a hundred years ago in changing the way we do philosophy. In other words, there's no separation between any of this. It's all connected together. One last thing. So the Arabs had idiomatically translated Aristotle into Arabic. When the Spanish were conquering Spain from the Muslims, they kept encountering libraries. The popes kept issuing edicts to burn all the books, just like when they had burnt the Great Library and just when they shut down the Academy of Athens. They wanted to continue this. The thinking went, you only need one book, it's the Bible, why are we doing this science stuff? We don't need this. What we need to do is purge the libraries of all these books that make me feel uncomfortable. Oh, no, that's now. Oh, wait, no, that was then too. It's so confusing how nothing changes. We don't learn. Well, the monks who were set us... Well, we do learn. We learn that if we don't agree with something, it cannot be taught. And it's like, mm, really? I don't agree with that because blah, 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 blah. Okay. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to agree with something and it can still be true. We do that today. Who were ordered to destroy the books were the Benedictines and the Dominican monks. The Benedictines and the Dominican monks didn't obey the order. What they did was they dug giant underground libraries beneath their monasteries. When they would show up to the place with the Muslim library that they had to burn, they would read, they would have a guy read they had a guy who would stand here and they had the book. They would turn the book so it was facing him so he could read it. He was a human card catalog. He knew the lists, the names of all the books they had in their secret underground library. So as you would walk by, he'd read it. If he recognized the book, he'd give you one signal and you'd dump it in a pile in the middle of the town. He'd give, if he didn't recognize it, he'd give you another signal and you'd walk over to a cart where they had a hidden panel and you'd slide the book into that and then you'd walk back and you'd go grab another book. And then you'd carry it so that that guy could read it. And then, oh, that one goes in this pile. And then afterwards they'd set that. So what, I'm, I'm gonna guess that the pile they're setting on fire is the pile of books that they already have. These would just be copies, so we don't need to keep them. We already have this, uh, you know, the same book. That's my guess. You wanna bet? I'll bet you a hundred thousand million dollars right now that I'm correct. Not a real bet. Void where prohibited. Um, not eligible in the state of Maine. That pile on fire so they could show everybody they were burning the books. And then they'd sneak the other books into their underground library where they were busy translating it from Arabic into ancient Greek and Latin. And that's how we have Plato and Aristotle. We would have lost it all because the Christians were going around burning everything. What happened that was, not only did the Benedictine and the Dominican monks have second, second thoughts about this and refuse to follow their orders, it's good to not follow orders sometimes.
But the Italians went, you know what I miss? The good old days when we had science and math and philosophy. Why don't we do that again? And sometime around 1300, they do the Renaissance. 1300, the Crusades end in 1291. After the Crusaders start coming back, they go, you know what we saw when we were there murdering all those Muslims and Jews? They had indoor plumbing and medicine and crop rotation. They're talking about things have gravity and that light has a finite speed and that the universe originates from a point of information. And the Italians go, oh wow, that's so cool. Let's do that here. Isn't that crazy? All right, let's do Q&A for a few minutes and then, I, and then we have to go. Absolutely. Okay, so the question is, does the Arabs being in Sicily for two centuries have an impact on the creation of the Renaissance? The answer is, yeah, there was a guy named Frederick II. He happens to be one of my favorite ever rulers. So the Vikings conquer northern France at, at one point. They rename northern France after themselves. They were the Northmen, Nordmen, Norsemen. They rename it after themselves. They, call, they were called the Normans. They call it Normandy. The Nor Normans at some point get really bored. They're like, dude, I'm no, that's pretty cool. I'm sick of watching peasants grow things. When was the last? So they're saying it in French, but with a Viking accent, right? Because they stopped speaking German. And they started speaking French. So just imagine, you know, like the the little thing. I can't do it. Harden that end, prefer it to dagen, right? Something like that. That means happy birthday. Um, so g get that going in your head, but do it in French. Je m'appelle Sven, ya. Yeah. It must have been horrific for French speakers to hear this. And they, one day they're just like, you know what, dude, let's go kill somebody. Now, the original killing event, they went to Spain, actually, and they captured Barabos, which today is Saragossa. It was a Muslim city. They capture it, and they're like, wow, this is awesome. So I need you to have in your head redhead and blonde head Vikings with long hair and braids and big beards, right? And they're just, they're just, you know, they got an ax, they're ready to hack people to death. They get there and they see the Arabs doing philosophy and math and science and they go, this is so cool. They take off their Viking clothing. They start wearing jalabeyas and they walk around learning Arabic and they blend into Arab society in Saragossa, in Spain. Well, word gets back to Normandy and the Normans are like, man, we, we could do this on a larger scale. So a group of them get in a ship. They sail all the way around Sicily, I'm sorry, around Spain to Sicily. They get to Sicily, they conquer it, and then, they're, then they have this really interesting situation because there's all these Arabic-speaking people living there. There are, there are people who are speaking Italian living there. And they're Christian because they had converted, right? It didn't, to, it didn't tone them down yet. They get toned down later, right? They're still, they're still little sociopaths. And then, little by little, they start to marry into German royalty. This is, this is complicated. And eventually, there's a guy named Frederick II. If you look at coins from the time period in Sicily, one side is in Arabic, the other side is in Latin. Frederick II actually had a bureaucracy made up of Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And he learned Arabic. He didn't just learn Arabic, he spoke Italian and German and French and like, I think two other languages. The dude was just, is that a polyglot? I forget what the depth, there's a polyglot, a polyglot. Anyway, whatever it is, he was that guy. And he would read texts in the original Arabic, and then sometimes he'd translate them in Latin. He even did his own science. He was so in love with the Muslim world that, that after throwing the Crusaders out, he was approached to see if he wanted the title of King of Jerusalem. And he didn't send an army and conquer it. It was just a symbolic gesture. He eventually will become the Holy Roman Emperor, which means he also owned Italy and Germany. And he's spreading his ideas. He got into falconry, right? The quintessential Arab sport. Like he's out there with falcons reading original Arabic script, learning how to do this. Uh, and it pissed off the popes. He got excommunicated twice. He led an army to Rome twice. 
he conquered it and captured the Pope and cut his head off a couple of times and instituted new popes a couple of times. I mean, you could, I mean, there's, there is that you could, you could do that. You could, you could say, Hey, um, just agree with me. And they might say, why should we? And you're like, cause I'll cut your head off. And they're just like, eh, all right. Point counterpoint, whatever you say goes. Instead, he was kind of like, Hey, you should agree with me. And they're like, why? And he goes, ah, uh, well, uh, might tickle you. And they were like, yeah, no, we're not going to agree with you. And he's like, good. Uh, bring in the guillotine. They were like, that's not a tickling device at all. I don't know. He lied to me. <laughs> I mean, there is that way, I guess, to get your point across and make sure everyone's on your side. A little beheading threat here and there. Times, Because all that science-y stuff that he was learning was apparently corrupting his soul. But yeah, it's the same time period. It's, the, it's that moment when Italy is rethinking Maybe burning the books wasn't a great idea. So you have two ways of thinking about this. You can pretend that Islam held on to Western civilization while Western civilization was burning itself to the ground and then Western civilization just reconstituted itself. Or you can realize the truth, which is that the Arabs were Western civilization all along. The Islam didn't necessarily save something that it wasn't. It saved itself. It just took it to a new level. The Arabs weren't doing something that was alien to them. They were part of Western civilization. They even had a Western civilization religion because right, it's an Islam is an Abrahamic religion. So they had all these Western civilization traditions. When they conquered that part of Rome and Persia, that, that was part of Western civilization that had never stopped being Western civilization. What happened is you were taught it in an Islamophobic way. So all the Muslim parts were just simply deleted. And so now we think of this as an east-west divide and somehow the Muslims are on the, on the east side of it. They're not. That woman, when she told me Egyptians are Easterners, she's just flat out wrong. This is part of Orientalism. It's an attempt to make you see the world as us versus them. It's not. It's just not. In Texas, for example, we do community property divorce. We got that from Mexico. Mexico is Catholic. It didn't have divorce. Mexico got it from Spain. Spain is Catholic. Spain didn't have divorce. When the Arabs ruled Spain, they got sick of all the deadbeat husbands who were divorcing their wives for younger models and then leaving the children to be raised by those divorced wives who no longer had a source of income. So there were all these kids living in the streets. So what, what, the, what they did in Spain was they created a system where all the property generated from the moment of the marriage's start to the moment of the marriage's end got split in half, period, end of story. That's community property law. So you know, you'll hear this thing that conservatives will say, I'm worried about Sharia law. Well, then don't get divorced because <laughs> that's Muslim law. The taco. When the Spanish conquered Mexico, they said, make this. The thing they were saying to make was shawarma because the Spanish were Arabs. They were just self-hating Arabs who rejected their Arabness. So they had flatbread food with meat in the middle and then vegetables and a sauce you put on it that they would fold like this. The Aztecs go, we don't have those ingredients. The Spanish go, you're our slaves. We're going to kill you. Make it anyway. <laughs> so the Mexicans went fine. And then they made a tortilla and they put meat on it. And they did a salsa because they needed the ingredients because they didn't have tahina and they were just stuck. So the next time you're eating tacos, remember that it's actually originally Arab food. It's just a Native American version of Arab food. I love tacos. As he was saying it in my mind, I want to end this video and go get tacos. <laughs> It's a little too early though. It's 9, 9.16 in the morning. Damn if I don't want a taco. I have enchiladas. It's not the same thing. But it is a tortilla with meat, refried beans, chili, cheese, and red enchilada sauce. And it's rolled up. And you roll up eight of them in this pan. And then I pour the rest of my red sauce, some chili, 
and then like two cups of shredded cheese on top and then you, th you cook the meat in advance and then you just throw it in a hot oven and it just basically melts the cheese and kind of everything's already cooked but it just kind of warms it all up again it's delicious damn it I don't want enchiladas but I already had breakfast and I had breakfast like three hours ago. Enchilada snack, maybe? Possibly? Al pastor, you're like, ah, that'll work. I'll eat pork. That way I don't have to actually eat Arab food because Arabs don't eat pork. So about a little bit less than 200 years ago, 150 years ago, Arabs started to move to Mexico. Those Arabs wanted to make shawarma. They're like, my God, tacos are basically just shawarma. How did that happen? Because they didn't know the original story. So they're sitting there going, ah, oh, I want to make the shawarma with lamb. I need a fatty meat. There just isn't enough. Is he about to say this is how gyros are made? Fatty meat and pork. And so the Arab Mexicans, if you've ever been to Mexico and you've eaten the pastor off the thing, it's the shawarma thing, but it's got pork on it. In other words, al pastor is Arab food twice. We're all interconnected. There's no separating any of this out from anything. Our language is like this. Admiral is an Arabic word. Zenith, nadir, algebra, those are all Arabic words. Zero is an Arabic word. Apricot is an Arabic word. <laughs> There's no winning if you really wanted to do this because we, there's no separating us out from each other. Okay, so the question is, why did Christianity reject all that philosophy and you know, right, set everything on fire at the same time that Muslims were embracing it? I don't think there's a simple answer. I think you know, there's, there's a historical moment that Christians found themselves in uh, as the Roman Empire was in decline, right? The Roman Empire almost went away in the third century. Diocletian saved it and reconstituted it. By that point, it goes Christian. And then on that, as, as the Roman Empire goes Christian, it's, it's in a terrible position. Its economy is garbage. Um, the population is poor. The population is small. Rome at one point was a million and a half people. By the time we get to the 6th century AD, there was about 50,000 Romans living in the city. So, so Rome itself was diminished. And I think in that moment, there was this sense of, it's hopeless, everything is falling apart around us. Let's turn to religion. We'll focus on religion. We'll just try to save our souls. We're not going to worry about the material world. And so I think that was the basis of the rejection that it came out of a sense of despair. But in the, at the same time, the Muslims were making this brand new empire. They were filled with vigor. They had this new religion. There, there was hope, there were dreams. They encountered philosophy and they fell in love with it and they ran with it. And so I think there was a little bit of that going on because right, then Christians go, oh my God, why do we burn all that? And then they bring it back and the next thing you know, Britain conquers 40% of the planet. And so there's this pendulum swing. <laughs> and I, I got to say, I like one end of the swing. I do. I love science. I love things like antibiotics. Antibiotics are wonderful. I love calculus. I think it's a great thing. You should learn it. Uh, physics. Boundless love of physics. When that pendulum comes swinging back the other way and we're setting books on fire and pulling them out of libraries in Texas, it freaks me out because I've seen this play before. I've read about it anyway, I wasn't there. And I know how this story ends. And you're not gonna like it. You're not. We don't need to do this again. We've done it before. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. Just for the record. Okay. I agree. We don't need to see the burning of books. Okay, well, I'm going to end this here. That was a good video. Very interesting. So, there's a thanks button. You can donate to the channel. You don't have to. All donations are appreciated. You can request videos. 
You can request videos without donating. They just take a little bit longer. Subscribe to the channel. That's a nice thing to do. Give a thumbs up. Just go ahead and click it right now. Go ahead. I'll wait. All right. And then there's the thumbs down button. And if you want to hit the thumbs down button, you can. I'm going to just, just like the one guy, I'm going to come to your house with this tickling device. And what I do is I strap you down in it. And then I pull a rope and this sharp metal blade comes down. And I haven't decided where I'm going to have it hit. But it's going to hurt for sure. I'll probably do one like, you know, like a hand. And then we do the other hand. And then we do a foot. And we do a foot. Don't worry. We will tie it off so you stay alive. Because that's the key. I'm not a murderer. You know, and then we'll... we'll put it in next time we'll go at the elbow and the elbow and then the knee the knee we'll tie it off make sure you're alive if you go into shock we'll, we'll wake you up you don't worry about that at all we'll keep you alive put you in the hospital and then you recover and then we take you right back to that magically little tickling device and we just go a little further and a little further until eventually you're just a you're just a body just rolling around good times. So until next time, you have a good day. Have a good day.